Mark chapter 11. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Mark chapter 11, and Janet's going to read. Oh, my voice is doing all right now anyway, so we're not doing so bad. Um, Janet's going to read this, uh, because she's pretty good at reading. And it's reading from the um, New King James Version. Uh, Smith Wigglesworth, you know, he used to have a famous saying. (laughs) He used to say, some people prefer the King James. Some people like to read it in Greek. Others in Hebrew. But I prefer to read it in the Holy Ghost. I like that, don't you? Right, I'm beginning to read at verse 12. Now the next day, when they had come out of Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. In response, Jesus said to it, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And his disciples heard it. So they came to Jerusalem. Then Jesus went into the temple and began to drive out those who had bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry wares through the temple. Then he talked, saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations? But you have made it a den of thieves. And the scribes and chief priests heard it and sought how they might destroy him. For they feared him, because all the people were astonished at his teachings. When evening had come, he went out of the city. Now in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. So Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God, for assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart but believes that those things he says will be done he will have whatever he says therefore I say to you whatever things you ask when you pray believe that you receive them and you will have them and whenever you stand praying if you have anything against anyone Forgive him, that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. Yeah, quite a passage, that. A lot in it. Um... It's also mentioned in John chapter 2. There's a slight difference. One is in John chapter 2, he takes cords and makes a whip and drives them out. It's also in John chapter 2, it's uh, just after he's turned water into wine. So it's at the beginning of his ministry, that one, that story. This is at the end of his ministry when when he's in Jerusalem. Some scholars say it's the same story, but I don't think so. But anyway, that's up for to people like yourself to work through some time. It certainly happened. Um, an interesting back thought, an interesting backdrop thought that I want us to keep this in mind as we read through this. And this was a quote from Charles Spurgeon, a famous preacher of last year. And he said this, The Holy Ghost rides in the chariot of scripture, not in the wagon of modern thought. So, keep that one there. Just to explain this, this is in Mark's Gospel, he gives us the 
typical format that we get in uh, the other Gospels as well. It's like the sandwich thing, or what the scholars called a chiism, a chiismus. Well, okay, sounds good, doesn't it? But it's a sandwich. In other words, it starts with a seed, ends with a similar scene, like the fig tree in this case, mentions the fig tree again, and then there's a bit in the middle that is the, it's got the punch, got the punch in it, the bit that we're after. Having said that, the passage ends with something really powerful, a message, something that we can lift out of it. And it's a bit about prayer, effective prayer and relationship with God. So there's quite a few pieces in this all together. So what I want to do is I want to start in the middle and work out. <laughs> okay, probably a safer way to do that, I don't know. So let's uh, stick the first slide up. Pictures, see, got some pictures. Look at that, got some pictures. There we are, just to give you some idea what, where this, where it took place. This is a model, a diagram, of course. Um, the bit that's in question is the court of Gentiles. Now, there was the women's court, Jewish women, and there was the court of Israel, which was the men, because the men were Israel. You see, very male-dominated culture and the court of the priests, which was very special, very sacred, very holy. Well, the bit that we're interested in is the court of the Gentiles. Now, that meant anybody could come in there, Jews, non-Jews. So the non-Jews, they were the Gentiles, because I, in Isaiah it says, My father's house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. But this is where the rumpus started, okay? This is where... There was a bit of a problem because the money changers in the temple were making a bit of a killing. They needed the money changers because they needed to change the currency into temple tight, temple money, which, and I have to read this because I can't remember it, it was called a Tyrian tetra tetradrama. Oh, don't ask me to say that one again. All right. Uh, from Tyre, and apparently it was a Roman agreed uh, currency that they used in the temple and it amounted to half a shekel. Whatever that is in real terms, I don't know. I have to, look, have to Google it. But the thing is, you see, the money changers in the temple were profiteering. They were making a killing. They were charging as much as they liked. They were selling doves and animals for sacrifice and uh, Thank goodness they weren't flogging books, so I'll start to put me in a bad light this morning. And um, they, were, they were doing all this, and they were very shrewd and devious about it. Okay, you could say, well, that was all right if it had been outside the temple. They could uh, say, well, okay, then, you know, do what you want. But it wasn't, it was inside, and that was the bit that rattled Jesus. He knew that they were um, exploiting religion. They were exploiting people's faith. They were exploiting people's weakness. Oh, by the way, I've got a watch. It's called a fossil watch. I can keep, the, I can keep time with this. You have to be a certain age to have one of these, a fossil watch. Right, okay. <clears throat> right. Thing is, people ask, why did Jesus get angry? It's not like Jesus, is it? Get angry, you know? Did he lose it for a bit? Did he lose it? You know, people ask this, don't they? I mean, I think we've all lost it at times, from time to time. But some years ago, I used to mess around with old cars. I remember doing a Morris Minor up years ago, and I got my head under the bonnet, and I must have scraped my nuts, the skin off my nuttles about three or four times on what you might call a recalcitrant nut and bolt. And I think the crown topper, literally, was when the bonnet came down and hit me on the head. <laughs> now, at times like this, the best thing to do is to grab a big handful of spanners and throw it at something. Don't do the car or what you're throwing it at much, because you've still got to find them in the garage afterwards, but it makes you feel better, doesn't it? Or a bit like Basil Fawlty, remember that one, where the car broke down and it got a big twig and came and he said, I'm going to give you a damn good thrashing, and he thrashed the car. You know, now, this is something, that's different, isn't it? 
Some years ago, I saw a, on the telly a bloke standing at the side of his Harley Davidson on the, on, the, on the platform in this church. Right? Now, Richard will like this because there's an Harley outside there at the moment. That's if it's still there because I noticed you haven't locked it up. I'll check it in a bit. Right. Okay. And he says, This is my pulpit, the Harley. Now, his name was Ben Priest, and he was the founder of a motorcycle group called Tribe of Judah. And their ministry is to tough criminals, hardened, tough gangsters. You know, I won't last five minutes. You know, it's this special ministry. And he must have stood about six foot eight, if he was an inch, and about six foot eight across. Big bloke. And uh, a bit like my little grandson, who's seen he walking about. And a big bloke, and he said, Yeah, I, says, I used to carry a Smith & Wesson in this side. Now I carry a King James. He said, I've got scars all over my body. And he said this, he says, I never used to start fights, but I always used to finish them. Now, that's the bit there. Jesus might have appeared to have caused a bit of a rumpus, but he finished it. He finished it. So I think it's time for another film clip. Stop him! Have you not heard? Have you not heard? Have you not heard? Have you not been told you from the beginning? What are your multitude of sacrifices to me, says the Lord? Bring forth no more offerings. that film, Robert Powell, the um, Jesus of Nazareth. It's a great clip, that one. Um, I suppose one thing you could say, it's easier to start a riot than to stop one. But he uh, was in control. I believe Jesus was very much in control because it says here, it says here, when I find it, he taught them. He began to teach them and they were amazed at his authority. Now, yeah, there was certainly the fuel for a riot there. There could have been, it could have got, but he, he commanded the situation, which is a, an incredible testimony to his divine presence. Actions speak louder than words. That's what it's saying to us. We get this in the Old Testament, the Old Testament prophets. Right through the Bible, actions that speak words. Remember, such as Moses when he went to Pharaoh and he threw the staff down, turned into a snake, and it had significance. The plagues of Egypt had significance. Um, Moses striking the rock. So, lots of actions. Elijah, Elijah, all these you can you can list them, and it was a, it had symbolic meaning. Now, this also had symbolic meaning. It. It was a situa he's seen a situation here where, as far as the so-called religion of the day were concerned, the tail, tail was wagging the dog, that it was an abuse. And turning the tables was significant of the need for a spiritual revolution. And also a foreshadowing of the new covenant to come. Jesus tipped the tables upside down at his resurrection. Or should we say, the right way up. And that was a point, I believe. If you remember in John chapter 2, and that was the other version of uh, the money change the temple, he said this, destroy this temple and I will rebuild it in three days. There we have it. Also, another point from this. It already warned people of wolves in sheep's clothing. Thieves that come to rob, steal, and destroy. Luke chapter 10. So throwing out the thieves and deceivers, he was making space for honest seekers. When I was hungry, 
you fed me. Thirsty, you gave me to drink, and so on. But Jesus didn't find that, did he? He didn't find spiritual food. He didn't find that at all. In fact, he saw a contrast between those who came to take and to rob and to steal and him who came to give. So let's have a look at the fig tree. Well, fig trees are supposed to be for making figs. If it looks like a fig tree and has leaves of a fig tree, then it should have fruit of a fig tree. At least that's basically what you'd expect if you'd see one. It came from Bethany, which means the house of figs. Figs are a very powerful, important um, symbol, emblem of Israel. Very powerful significance. It signifies peace, prosperity. And in fact, it goes way, way back to Genesis, where the Adam and Eve took figs to make aprons. It goes right through the Bible. It's um, in 1 Kings, it mentions such as each man will sit under his own vine and under his own fig tree with no one to frighten him. It was very powerful of Israel's prosperity and also, consequently, God's blessing. So that was it. So when Jesus cursed the fig tree, he was making a powerful statement, a very powerful statement. They'd, they, see, they had what you might call a form of godliness. And we get this from Timothy, don't we? A form of godliness but denying the power thereof. Or a form of godliness but not the reality, if you like. They knew the right words to say and all the right thing. They could make all the right noises, but they had failed in their responsibility to feed the spiritually hungry. You know, we can switch that to where we are today and we can say, well, um, we've got some fantastic churches in this country and the world. And I know John Wesley said, preach the gospel in the most up-and-date and modern way. And I think that was a great guideline for us. But... We can have all the lights and um, state-of-the-art bells and whistles. That's great. But unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. So Psalm 127. So, okay, let's move to the next bit. And it's the last bit that I'm interested in. The bit here that talks about, have faith in God, for I assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, and does not doubt it in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray and believe, believe that you've received and you will have them. Wow. And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him that your Father in heaven may also forgive you and your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your heavenly Father forgive your trespasses. Interesting. Why does he stick that one in? Well, I think he's talking about the prayer of a righteous man or woman. In this passage, I believe he is wanting to show the contrast of a clean heart against the corrupt outward show of the twisted religion of the day. A clean heart. Psalm 51 says this, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Wow, that's good stuff, isn't it? The prayer of a righteous man availeth much, says James chapter 5. I've met people, you know, who have ranted and raved because they've prayed for somebody and it didn't work. Well, we know it don't work sometimes. We know it doesn't stop us from praying, does it? It never stops us from praying for people. Never, ever, if we don't get the results, it never, ever does because the Bible talks about persistence. We have met people who said, well, it didn't work, it didn't work, it didn't work. 
Yeah, we ever read the last bit where it says, uh, the prayer of a righteous man availeth much. You know, Perhaps that might be a key, I don't know. But not to be too flippant about this. It says here, doesn't it? It's pointing to this. That we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, temple, temple of the Holy Spirit, here we are again. 1 Corinthians 6. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Once again, takes us right back to Genesis, right back to the original sin, right back to what started it all. How in the Garden of Eden, the enemy was invited in. He didn't just stand there with big horns, right, you know, looking like a politician or something that you can think of, right? He, no, he was attractive, attractive. It was a can't be invited in. The word for the devil, say serpent, the Jewish word is nashesh, which has a primary and secondary meaning of like a lot of words. And that could also mean a attractive, enchanting being with musical qualities and a serpent like nature. Now that puts it in a different field altogether. So he was invited in, came in sat down, took command, big smile, without firing a shot. So, the prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So, where's this going? Well, I think it's taking us to what the Bible calls sound doctrine. We know he'd had, had trouble with a with the, uh, twisted variation of what was happening in the temple of the day. Sound doctrine. It const- the Bible talks constantly in Timothy and Titus, you read it, about the importance of sound doctrine. It's rooted in Genesis. Henry Morris, the founder of the Creation Ministries International about 100 years ago, said this. Genesis is probably the most important book in the world. Now, I think you can take probably out and say Genesis is the most important book in the world because it tells us about the Creator. It tells us where we've come from. It tells us why we're here. It tells us where we're going. It tells us why there's problems in the world. And it tells us what God has intended doing about it. So it's rooted. Sound doctrine begins there. This is, we have what we call a pattern. The fruits of the Spirit, you mentioned it earlier, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, self-control. Against such there is no law, it says. Yeah? In Galatians. This is the Jesus pattern. This is our integrity. Our identity and our integrity. We've been on about our identity. That's it. Today... Everybody's looking for somebody with integrity. <laughs> you know, it's a joke, isn't it, when you turn the telly on. We should be people of integrity. The Bible is our book, foundation, our anchor. The Word of God. It says in Psalm 119, and if you've got an hour to spare, you can read through it because it's about the longest one. In the, in, the, in the lot, it says that your word is a lantern to my feet and a light to my path. What well, he says this: Oh, how I love your law! What a strange thing! Whoa, oh, how I love your law! The psalmist says, and that phrase is all over the Old Testament. It comes up left, right, and centre. Oh, how I love your law, because the law gives life. And he says, your law, your word, we cut with the word, we can, that's what we're looking at for us, is a lantern to our feet, which enables us to watch our step, so we don't fall, get into trouble, slip, yeah? But it's also a light to our path, to give us vision. So it's two things, a lantern to our feet, and a light to our path, to show us the way. The Jesus pattern has vision because without vision, people perish. That's what it says, Proverbs 29. Without vision, people perish. We, part of our identity is vision. 
Yeah? Integrity, vision, based on the word. Sound doctrine. Some years ago, Janet and myself used to do a spot of sailing. Right? We used to love it, didn't we? <laughs> we had some fun. But, you know, and, uh, I, I used to, I went on all the courses, yeah? Navigation and all that. Oh, right. And um, I remember two or three times we've been sailing, and if you hadn't got the compass, if you weren't following the compass spot on, according to what the chart said, you want to be off a few degrees, and if you've gone a few miles, you can miss the landing by a heck of a lot. It's a bit like orienteering, isn't it, if you've done that. You know, if, you get, if you've not keep sticking to the compass direction, you're a little bit off, you're going to be miles off after a few, uh, probably a mile or so. You're going to really miss it. And so, what the best thing to do is, is to set waypoints, isn't it? They set waypoints. So, you, you know, you set one for one bit, establish that, then move again, and so you're secure and you know what you're going. That's sound doctrine. Keep meeting together. Do not, in, do not stop meeting together. Waypoints. Do not stop reading the word. Waypoints. Do not stop praying for one another. Waypoints. All these things we do in church are here for our security, our keeping us on the right path. For uh, These are waypoints. In Timothy 4 it says this. This is a warning. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their de own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. We can see that. You know, it's even possible, in fact, it's probably likely in some places, to go to university to study theology and not even open a Bible. Yeah. Shocking, isn't it? Henry Morris said this, when the teachings of men conflict with the teachings of God, it's wise to go with God. I think that's a fair one. Okay. To quote Liam Power, I'm making the landing approach. I've got the wheels down. So let's, let's sum up. Our personal walk with God will be reflected in how people see us as a church. This is our identity. This is what we've been discussing over what with Steve and so on. Uh, not Steve, Chris. Psalm 127 says this. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? We are the salt of the earth. Our Christian identity must have its foundation in sound doctrine. We are the salt of the earth. And in Matthew chapter 5, 6, it says there that if the salt has lost its savour, it's only good for throwing away. If the church has lost its sound doctrine, has lost its saltiness, then it becomes a joke. I don't know who said this. Perhaps Jim McGlady is good at things like that, but he's not here. But somebody said this. It might have been Spurgeon or one of these great guys in the past. He said, it'll be a terrible day when we can't tell the difference between the church and the world. We're going back now to what we said right at the beginning. The Holy Ghost rides in the chariot of Scripture and not the uh, wagon of the teaching of modern people. I think someone, I've got right at the front. I'll get it in a minute. <laughs> Here we are. The Holy Ghost rides in the chariot of Scripture, not in the wagon of modern thought. Well, Sometimes, of course, we need to upturn a few things in our lives. I think this is probably a constant thing. This is called working out your salvation. And we have to do this quite often. 
Sometimes we need to throw things out which hinder our spiritual growth, whatever that might be. But be encouraged because Jesus could move mountains. His promise was to say, I'll get you there. When you've signed up with me, I'll make sure you get there. Don't worry. Might be a bit rough, but we'll get there. Finally, we preach the gospel because we believe it is the answer. We believe it is the answer. When Paul, when Paul came to Corinth, he said this. He said this. And brethren, when I came to you, I did not come with excellent speech or wisdom, declaring to you the, dis the testimony of God. My speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not be the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And he was a well-educated man. And he says he came in, in fear and trembling at that. I love this bit in Isaiah. And this, once again, is the Jesus pattern. He talks about the fast in Isaiah 58, the fast. The fast is, oh, if you like, the Jesus pattern. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and that you bring your house the poor who are cast out? When you see the naked and you cover them and not hide yourself from their own flesh, then shall your light break forth like the morning and your healing shall spring forth speedily and your righteousness shall go before you. What a powerful bit. Martin Lloyd-Jones said this to sum up, and this is the last bit before I go. I've got the wheels down, I'm touching the tarmac. Okay. Christians must know that Jesus is the answer to everything. This means they must choose to listen to him over anything else, rather than twisting his words to fit into what they want them to mean. They need to clearly understand and to live out the truths he gives through his holy word. The most important thing in the Christian walk is their relationship with God. And I think that sums it Thank you.